Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's Illness Lecture. Now, just a few information before I introduce a speaker. So this webinar is going to be recorded. So those who couldn't make it tonight will have the opportunity to watch it later via our YouTube channel. And for tonight's attendees, after the presentation, there will be a Q&A session with the speaker. If you have a question, please could you type your question in the Q&A box, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. And I will then read the question to the speaker and she will be happy to answer any questions you have. So I am really pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Katharina Gruneisel, who is currently a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Geography at the University of Nottingham. And she is also an affiliated researcher at the Institut de Recherche sur les Maghreb Contemporains. And she is mostly interested in cities, ethnography, economies and work. And indeed, as part of her present research, she is studying the used clothing trade and garment industry in Tunisia and Jordan. And I'm also very pleased to say that she is the recipient of one of our Billness Postdoctoral Writing Fellowship in support of this research. Um, Katharina concluded her PhD research in 2021 at the University of Durham with a dissertation that looked at market and space making in Tunis. Before that, she was a, awarded a postgraduate certificate in research methods at the University of Durham in 2017 and a Master's of Sciences in Urban Policies at the London School of Economics in 2014. She's also been a postdoctoral research fellow first at the Ecole des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris in 2022, and before that, a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Geography of Leipzig University from 2021 to 2022. She has already published a range of contributions in journals and other volumes on these topics, in particular, a contribution in 2021 on Rethinking Global Urbanism in Tunis, published in an edited volume on Global Urbanism, Knowledge, Power and City. And then in 2020, a paper on secondhand shoe circulations in Tunis, processes of valuation and the production of urban space in the journal Articulo, Revue de Sciences Humaines. Tonight's talk will be focused on her current research and is titled Contested Urban Fabrics, Making Markets with Secondhand Garments in Tunis. So without further ado, Katharina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolo, for this very generous introduction, um, for hosting me. Uh, tonight, and I also want to kind of start again by explicitly thanking Bilnas for its very precious um, support over those past uh, four months, where the postdoctoral writing fellowship has uh, allowed me to pause my current position uh, at the University of Nottingham to focus on finally kind of concluding uh, my book proposal and to work on the first on some of the chapters of my first manuscript that um, I hope at least in part uh, to introduce to you, uh, let's say over these next 30 to, to 40 minutes. Um, for this occasion today, I was uh, asked to prepare a talk that is kind of free of academic jargon. And uh, I hope I, I did so to make this interesting and accessible also for those who don't um, have uh, let's say, a, a particular interest in, in urban studies, which is where my book project hopes to make its, its central contribution, nor necessarily uh, Tunisia or Tunis, uh, from where I join you tonight, um, nor, of course, the used garment economy, which is a rather peculiar uh, world that I hope to kind of introduce you to. Um, so, as Nicola already said, my talk is entitled Contested Urban Fabrics, Making Markets with Secondhand Garments in Tunis. 
And I would like to start by briefly introducing um, the larger book project on which today's talk is based. So my book project um, examines how European and North American secondhand clothing donations, uh, but also fast fashion surplus materials that arrive on shipping containers like the one you see pictured here in the Tunis container port Rades, how these materials um, are reincorporated into market exchange in Tunisia's capital city. And as North Africa's largest current importer and re-exporter of used clothing, uh, Tunisia and, and specifically its capital city provides a privileged vantage point uh, to ask how transnational surplus clothing becomes the material basis for renewed market making. So these objects are cast out in their origin countries as excess or as leftovers um, and must thus be actively reincorporated into the market to qualify as commodities and indeed um, as fashion. So through a historically grounded ethnographic um, examination of how markets are made uh, with such imperfect commodities uh, in Tunis, my book project advances a perspective on the urban market as an inherently unstable arrangement. The book thus studies these diverse processes and practices that have created urban markets for fripe, and fripe is the French word for used garments that is also used in Tunisia that you see here as an inscription on the marquee uh, of this shop that advertises fripe de luxe, so luxury used garments. So my question is how uh, have markets been made with these imports since the onset of uh, large-scale used clothing imports to Tunisia in the, sec in the end of the Second World War. And so in doing so, the key argument really I want to make in my book is that processes of market making uh, also co-constitute or co-fabricate the city, here specifically, specifically Tunis, through diverse forms of spatial, social, and cultural production, as well as negotiations and at times contestations over urban orders. To do so, and here I will make a very brief uh, conceptual point, um, my project takes inspiration uh, from Calon um, in, in looking at markets, not as something that is simply existent and can be taken for granted, but as something uh, to cite Calon uh, that has to be kind of constituted first through processes of framing, so acts that delimit the market from what is outside the market, and second, through performances. So markets are something that are like conform performatively constituted or enacted. And what my project does is that it brings this perspective on the market, as we've already seen, to the very back end of the global garment value chain and to the city. And this means not just to an urban scale, so it's not just to ask how, you know, how does market making take place in a city, but rather to examine how free markets, um, by the way in which they are delimited and enacted in Tunis, how they co-constitute urban orders. And I hope that this will become less abstract by what I want to do um, over the next half an hour, which is introduce you to three actors that play um, different roles in making markets with the FRIP uh, in Tunis. So I will focus this, uh, structure this talk around three ethnographic encounters. Uh, first, we will encounter a ministerial employee who has been in charge of reforming uh, the used clothing sector um, in the wake of the 2011 Tunisian revolution. Then we will meet a, a wholesale and retail trader for used clothing who participated in the auto construction of the first uh, permanent free marketplace of Tunis. And third, um, a female sorting worker who is specialized in the collection of leftovers from Tunis marketplaces. So let's turn to C. Selim. And I entitled this first encounter, um, The State as Market Maker. It is autumn 2017, and I have been trying to secure an interview with the customs authorities, the Ministry of Commerce, the Ministry of Industry for over a month to no avail. Yet suddenly trying a new phone number that has been given to me by one of the security men at the door on a slip of paper, I suddenly receive a favorable response and am invited for a meeting the next morning. 
To my even greater surprise, the reception officer in the Ministry of Commerce knows my name when I arrive and escorts me through the endless building hallways. When we enter the meeting room, several air conditioners are humming and fresh lemonade and snacks have been arranged on an oversized meeting table. Cicelim, the ministerial employee who awaits me alongside his secretary, seems taken aback by my young age and the fact that I have come alone. I, and, and I understand soon after why. As he settles down on the other end of the giant glass table to express his regret, and here I cite that the FRIP or used clothing sector in Tunisia is closed for further investments as it is undergoing comprehensive reform and restructuring. I realize that I have in fact been mistaken for a representative of a German surplus clothing collection and export business who wants to set up a business partnership or more probably still use clothes sorting factories in Tunisia. It turned out later that my mistaken identity had in fact brought me in contact with one of the key actors of what Sisilim himself, I cite him, described as one of the countless political failures of the post-revolution period. In 2014, um, after the first free elections following the demise of the Ben Ali regime in Tunisia, Sitelim was put in charge of the so-called FRIP file in the Ministry of Commerce and was asked to oversee a process of urgent reform of a sector that was perceived as a parallel economy, Iqtisad Mawazi, which had descended into complete anarchy since the revolution. Unprecedented and largely unchecked volumes of surplus clothing imports, you see here, so the, the number um, that is most frequently cited by the Ministry of Commerce was 150,000 tons uh, imported annually, but the actual volume is very likely much higher. So this combined with the temporary withdrawal of uh, security forces from public space in the wake of the revolution had translated into sprawling free trading landscapes everywhere in Tunisia's capital city by summer 2017. As Cicilim explained, such processes of what he called fripisation, a vernacular word creation that describes the uncontrolled expansion and takeover of urban space through the frip trade, had become an emblem of a failing state, Daula Fashala, after the revolution and exerted pressure on the government to act. So in parallel to violent market clearance campaign in the capital city, um, organized by the local authorities and executed by the police that I was kind of observing in real time, repeated attempts of regular re reform of the FRIP sector unfolded behind closed doors at the highest level of the state, including the Ministry of Commerce. The reform process implicated five different ministries, commerce, industry, social affairs, finance, and the interior, each of which had in fact vested interests in maintaining a part of its regulatory responsibility. Ultimately, interministerial blockage, but also the capacity of free sector representatives, and especially the wholesalers and importers, to rapidly mobilize the media and thousands of traders thwarted reform attempts. And in 2018, during a wave of countrywide protests against government plans to cut subsidies, the Ministry of Interior itself intervened to put C. Selim's re reform project permanently on hold. As a consequence of this, to the present day, the FRIP sector in Tunisia remains regulated by a decree that was passed in 1995 by the then Ben Ali regime. As I show in my research, this 95 regulatory framework provided the basis for transforming Tunisia from what was a mere importing country of used clothing into a major FIP sorting and re-export hub. And here you see some of the statistics for 2019 from the Observatory of Economic Complexity that show, especially on the left, it's interesting because it shows that Tunisia in 2019 was the single biggest re-exporter uh, of used clothing on the African continent. So this transformation was achieved by defining free sorting and recycling in this 95 law as partially export oriented activities and thus to exempt the FRIP in Tunisia from import taxes. While on paper, this was made conditional upon the re-export 30% of imported materials and the recycling of another 20%, no one ever um, respected this rule in practice. 
Rather, FRIP imports grew exponentially after 95, and 50 FRIP sorting factories began to operate in Tunisia. The rationale for the new regulation was the increasingly lucrative transnational used clothing business that had developed during the 1980s, linked to sinking costs of international container shipping and a surge in charitable clothing collection in Europe and North America that was indirectly subsidized through tax deductions. Consequently, worldwide exports of secondhand clothing grew sixfold between 1980 and 1995. Moreover, Tunisian migrants in Europe had established commercial collection and export companies for used garments, with some pioneering entrepreneurs recognizing the cost-saving opportunities that lay in relocating labor-intensive clothes sorting processes to Tunisia. With the 95 legislation, the Ben Ali regime now established Tunisia as a strategic stopover location for FRIP coming from Europe and North America on the way to Africa, the world's single largest export market for used garments. And it positioned regime cronies in the lucrative sector. So 50 licenses for used clothing import were handed out between 95 and 99. And as I then heard from C. Selim in 2017, the sector was subsequently closed to further investments, stabilizing a de facto oligopoly position of the existing importers. While Sisi Lim and his colleagues in the Ministry uh, of Commerce like to describe the FRIP as a parallel economy, um, thus located uh, outside the boundaries of law and regulation, delimiting the economy proper, it can, in fact, in no way be described as a realm of state absence. Quite on the contrary, a close look at the 95 framework, but also the failed reform process between 2014 and 2018, underlines the state's central role in constituting the free market in contemporary Tunis. What I argue is that, in fact, from the very onset of free imports to Tunisia, as you see here in this document, um, the documents military and wartime surplus uh, clothing that was exported to the then French colony by the Allied forces in the final during the final years of the Second World War. So from this onset of military free imports, the delimitation of market boundaries was in fact intentionally kept ambiguous. As this inventory here from the National Archives shows, military free um, from the United States here imported in 19, 1944 shows that the FRIP was officially destined for charitable distribution. However, in fact, the FRIP were traded on a flourishing black market from the 1940s onwards with the active implication of French colonial officials. This ambiguous positioning of the FRIP on the margins of the formal economy, in fact, enabled and continues to enable diverse registers of state participation in market making from informal taxation through the customs authorities to politicized practices of distributing trading licenses. The interministerial blockage and eventual failure of Sicilim's reform does in fact shed light on the economic and political stakes of different state actors in participating in market making with the FRIP. So now I want to um, kind of turn to our second encounter in a very different place and different position of hierarchy in the local uh, value chain um, in Tunis. And we will meet uh, Hamadi. And I entitled this second encounter, uh, Rural Migrants as, as Market Makers. So during the night of Wednesday, May 13th, 2020, a fire destroyed large parts of the oldest free market of Tunis in the Hafsia, a district that forms part of the Medina. The fire erupted in the early morning hours and the blaze turned to ashes the livelihoods of 13 free traders in the inner market, most of whom were elderly men who had auto constructed their stalls and warehouses in this location from the mid 1960s onward. Hamadi's stall and storage, albeit located in the middle of the market, were miraculously spared by the fire. When I came to the market several days later, I found a cement mixer at the center of the destroyed marketplace and several men at work with shovels. What are they building? I asked Hamadi, bewildered at the concrete in the middle of what I knew to be a market consisting of wooden stalls. 
The new market, Hamadi laughed, to make sure no one can take our place in the Medina, Placetna fil Medina. I learned that the Frip traders were wary of the authorities' attention after the fire and were scared that the raising of stalls could be used as a pretext to seize the municipal land on which they had auto-constructed their market. As Hamadi put it, we didn't want to give the state, al Hakim, any opportunity, so we created facts on the ground. When the fire occurred, I had known Hamadi and the other Hafsiya Frip traders for almost three years. I was hence familiar with the traders' pride in not only establishing the first permanent Frip market of Tunis, but also in contributing to one of the most ambitious urban renewal and modernization projects of post-independence Tunis in the Hafsiya district. And here you see the Hafsiya district mapped in red, so in the middle of what is kind of dark gray, which is the Medina, the historic old city of Tunis. And yet at the same time, despite despite um, the successful consolidation of their free marketplace in the Hafsiya for over 50 years, a feeling of ephemerality prevailed. The free trade's exclusion from definitions of heritage and traditional craft and its portrayal as an illegitimate encroacher lay at the heart of the traders' acute sense of precariousness. Indeed, in spite of the Frieb's contemporary ubiquity in the Hafsiya district, the trade and its constituencies remain conspicuously absent from the urban renewal project's documentation. And the project stakeholders, planners, and architects that I met were reluctant to discuss the free trade's role in transforming the urban district. I thus began to reread the story of urban transformation of the Hafsiya from the life stories of rural migrant traders. And Hamadi's story begins with the occupation of a demolition site at the core of the Hafsiya neighborhood. It's pictured here in 1970. In fact, the entire Hara Hafsiya district, part of which constituted the former Jewish ghetto of Tunis, had been slated demo for demolition once by the colonial authorities and then again after independence. The so-called emergency demolitions were however halted in the mid 1960s due to mounting resistance and this left gaping holes in the middle of the dense urban fabric, while a more comprehensive modernization and renewal project for the Hafsiya was being elaborated. Hamadi was a young man then and had arrived without any possessions from Tunisia's Northwest as part of a large rural urban uh, migration wave during the 1960s. Tunis underwent radical demographic changes at the time, resulting in the large houses of the Medina being subdivided and rented out to impoverished rural migrants. The trade in imported uh, used clothing at the time, mainly coming from the United States, was considered a poverty trade that remained excluded from urban marketplaces. Hamadi, like many other new arrivals from the countryside, thus made a precarious living selling Frieb as an itinerant trader. And this demolition site at the heart of the Hafsiya constituted a unique opportunity to occupy a first permanent trading ground. As you see in this picture, the traders um, consolidated their vending spaces first by erecting half z structures and then gradually wooden stalls, turning the field of rubble into the first Tunis Frieb market. And here you see what the market looked like before the fires or the entrance to this auto-constructed marketplace. By the time the Hafsiya renewal project was then launched in 1973, this auto-constructed market was already lovingly referred to as Souk Kennedy for its specialization in American used clothing, denim, check shirts, all the things you couldn't find elsewhere on Tunis marketplaces. And yet the authorities decided to displace the free traders in order to attract, and I cite the project document, modern forms of commerce with higher value added building a new dedicated market infrastructure for the purpose that you see here. Yet, and I don't have time here to go into the kind of intricacies of how this happened, but after a long period of first forced displacement, then conflict and negotiation, in fact, the very opposite came true. As the local authorities struggled to attract tenants and buyers for this new commercial infrastructure, yet at the same time relied on private finance to complete the ambitious and expensive modernization. They eventually agreed to let the free traders move into this 
same new market infrastructure. So rather than displacing the free marketplace, the traders now actually expanded their market to new parts of the neighborhood. Especially those traders who had entered uh, the wholesale trade, like Hamadi, accumulated considerable wealth and capital, and so in fact provided the bulk of the private finance that funded also the second phase of urban renewal. And here you see um, on this map, so in, in gray is the kind of Hafsiya district, you see in dark yellow at the bottom, you see the kind of original auto-constructed marketplace on the demolition site. Then in purple opposite, you see the um, new market infrastructure that the free traders kind of expanded to and moved into in the 70s. And in green, you see how the kind of wholesale trade of the free gradually enveloped the entire new and second phase of uh, the Hafsiya. So Hamadi's auto-constructed market stall and his wholesale storage bought in the 1980s from his savings in one of the new infrastructures of the Hafsiya renewal project. These spaces materialize the livelihood that he has built as a rural migrant arriving in the capital city with little more than the clothes he wore. While he is now retired and has handed over business to his son Ahmed, he still regularly comes to the Hafsiya to meet the other traders or simply sit and sip tea watching the market. For Hamadi and many other elderly traders, market making constituted the physical and social process through which they made a place for themselves in the city. With the free market being not only a source of livelihoods in an economic sense, but also a site of inhabitation, where social relations and identities and a sense of belonging emerged in what was initially an alien and hostile urban environment. Taken together, the life histories of pioneer market makers like Hamadi expose what I call counter histories of urban transformation. As they trouble dominant accounts of urban renewal as a coherent success story. Rather, they show us how the interstices, shifting and unanticipated alliances and competing agendas at the heart of this grand urban project transformed the flip traders from encroachers to central project stakeholders. And yet, despite the fact, as we see in this photo, that the FRIP until today envelops the entire Hafsiya district and has in fact overwritten the aesthetics and architectures of the urban renewal project, the FRIP traders role in transforming uh, the city remains completely unacknowledged in order, as I argue, to preserve the stable distinctions between modern and backward urban forms, but also planned and unplanned markets that continue to underpin contemporary urban governance. Is there time for a, our third encounter or? <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh. I'll just drink a sip of tea. So um, the third encounter is uh, Munia, and um, I have entitled this encounter Remaking Urban Market Boundaries. The first heavy November rains have left large puddles on the muddy grounds of the Sukul Joma Friday market of Shotrana, and the green plastic cords holding together the free bales float on the water surface. It is past midday and the free traders are busy folding up on unsold merchandise, tying them back together into bundles and wrapping them in plastic tarpaulin. Others are already disassembling their market stalls and the rattling of the iron bars announces the end of the market day. On the market's fringes, where the traders' pickup trucks are parked, a group of women has gathered. Some of them have climbed onto the loading area of the truck sifting through a large pile of free merchandise. Others sort heaps of garments and shoes spread out on tarpaulin sheets on the ground and on the bonnet of another truck. Munia is one of the women searching through the leftovers next to an elderly Tunisian woman and a group of younger women from Côte d'Ivoire. Munia's hand movements are faster than those of the other women and she rapidly stores away her finds in a hand trolley that she has parked right behind her. Munia cannot be distinguished from other female shoppers, as many women come to the Tunis fleet markets with trolleys for transporting the clothing items they have selected. Yet Munia underlines that for her, the Tunis fleet markets are workplaces, 
as she sorts through the piles of used clothing and market leftovers, not for private provisioning or shopping, but for commercial resale. Munya, like other predominantly female market clients, thus engages in manual processes of sorting, referred to as fars in Tunisia, through which the valuable is distinguished from the valueless through intricate processes of material inspection and assessment. While for most market clients, FIP sorting um, constitutes a routine part of their consumer practices, Munia proudly identifies as Farraza, the female professional designation that she uses for sorter. As Munia explains, professional sorting requires, and I cite her, a real eye and a feel for the garments, both of which she considers to be exclusively feminine qualities. She also underlines the long experience that has turned her into a good and professional Farraza, as she rapidly distinguishes not just an object's brand value or stylistic appeal, but can also assess the material quality and reusability of particular parts of the garments, such as zippers or buttons, within the fraction of a second. Munia works in marketplaces all across the capital city. And you can see here mapped uh, in green, just some of the kind of largest permanent free markets of the city of Tunis where Munia works. Yet Munia also travels to the weekly markets that are not mapped here, the Souk is why, that take place on specific weekdays in all of the 34 municipalities that today comprise greater or metropolitan Tunis. Monia often times her movement across and beyond these and, and between these Tunis marketplaces to coincide with the bi-weekly rhythms of bail opening in each marketplace. Bail opening in Tunisia is referred to as Halan al-Bala and designates the moment when new Frit merchandise is disclosed in what resembles publicly staged collective events. And in this picture, you see under the table the closed balas in which the Frip merchandise is packaged. And these are then in the Halan al balas or the bail opening, are kind of cut open in a ritualized uh, manner. And then are kind of um, given, the, the individual clothing items are then given for inspection. So in these kind of public events of bail opening, private shoppers rub shoulders with informal sorting workers um, or other collectors. Monia then often stays on after market closing hours to look through leftovers or to wait for particular stall owners who already know her and pass on unsold or unwearable garments. Monia then transports her trolley all the way to her working class neighborhood on the peri-urban fringes of Tunis called with Lil, a name that Monia smilingly attributes to the neighborhood having been largely built up illicitly or in the dark of the night, as it is called the Valley of the Night. At home, Monia has repurposed one of a part of her daughter's bedrooms as a workshop where she fits her sewing machine, stores the clothing items, and has arranged a shelf with all the accessories and fabrics she gathers for manufacturing new clothing. Munia washes, irons, repairs, and at times completely disassembles the garments she brings home, creating new value from what has been cast out as leftovers. While she mainly resold to extended family members and neighborhood acquaintances at first, she now delivers to a female-owned clothing shop in Wait Elil. As the street markets of Tunis are expensive and difficult to reach from the peri-urban neighborhood, and as most of the women in Wit Lil work and have little time for lengthy trips to the marketplaces, such shops provide a valuable source of affordable clothing, especially for women and children. So while officially in Tunisia, al fars sorting takes place in sorting factories like the one you see pictured here, and the farazat, the sorters, are factory workers, at the same time, innumerable informal farazats like Munia work all over the Tunis Frit marketplaces. And they indeed remake the urban market's boundaries on a day-to-day -day level in two important ways. First, through the valuation work that consists of sorting, as we've seen, but also of repair and at times complete reprocessing, 
they redraw boundaries between what is included and what remains excluded from the market or between leftovers and reusable consumer goods. And second, by bringing these clothing items into renewed circulation between the marketplaces and their private homes and then diverse resale locations, they expand the geographical boundaries of the urban market. Far beyond any confined marketplace, following Farazat like Munia, sheds light on urban workplaces and sites of production that remain typically un invisible. This unsettles dominant portrayals of the Frip as Alam Rijal, the men, a men's world, exposing instead gendered market making agencies that are central to enacting the contemporary urban Frip market. So just very briefly, um, as a kind of conclusion to this, I hope um, that these three encounters and the kind of intimate insights um, they have offered into people's uh, diverse roles in, in market making in the contemporary free market, that these encounters have shown why uh, a study of market making processes at the back end of the global value chains open a particular perspective on how and where uh, markets are made and about who takes agency um, in such processes. Um, I think first because the FRIP's positioning as we've seen as a form of boundary object between here what is pictured discard or rests but then also what has become in Tunisia a very cherished uh, consumer good um, that is valued for its brand authenticity, its originality. Um, this kind of um, situation or this, this kind of positioning of the FRIP as a boundary object uh, opens a perspective on the market here, not as a kind of hegemonic global force, uh, the neoliberal market, but rather as an unstable arrangement or field of power. So the FRIP market, to come back maybe to Calon's term, uh, appears as something that remains precariously framed both as a sector of the economy and as a trading form in the city, as it was never fully included nor completely excluded from the market. And it remains in process as its boundaries, both geographical and social are renegotiated over time. Um, and the last point I want to make is that I have titled this FRIP as, as urban fabrics. So I'm interested of course in asking the question well, what kind of perspective on city making um, does this perspective on, on market making offer when we consider the fabrics of the FRIP uh, as fabrics of, of the urban? Um, and I think what these encounters have shown that uh, looking at market making as a process of city making brings into view uh, actors and processes uh, that typically remain excluded from accounts of urban transformation and also foregrounds how mundane economic processes of exchange, of circulation, of valuation, um, co-constitute urban orders. Some temporary, like the kind of performances of bail opening that Munia takes part in, in public space, and some more durable, like uh, the auto-constructed marketplace um, of, of Hamadi that becomes a central site uh, of, of inhabitation. Thank you very much for your attention and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much, Katharina, for this excellent presentation. And um, we now have time for a Q&A session with our audience. So for those who joined us late, if you have a question for Katharina, could you please type the question in the Q&A box which you find at the bottom of your screen, and I will read the question to Katharina. Um, yeah, I mean, there are so many interesting things about this uh, talk, and then of course it's a topic that I know very little, or almost nothing about, but it really is an interesting one. Um, before one looks at the dynamics of the local markets in Tunisia, I was wondering, how do these clothes come to Tunisia? How is that regulated? Is it like several individual companies shipping all the goods to Tunisia or is there like a sort of centralized system 
for some of the major suppliers or is that completely unregulated? Should I reply straight yeah. away? Yeah, yeah, well, if you... <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, it's true that I, I didn't go into this because I get I wanted to kind of uh, focus on what is the core of um, what, what I'm kind of interested in in, in the book project. Um, but of course, there's a, a backdrop of a, a, a global economy and the global market here. And I think I alluded to it, especially in the first part, when I kind of spoke about how um, the global used uh, clothing market really turned into um, a, 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 an economy of scale um, from the 1980s onwards. And um, so, again, right, the, the kind of origins of the secondhand uh, clothing market is, is the First World War and the Second World War, where for the first time there was a, a kind of were quantities of surplus that were endangering uh, the markets of Europe and the United right. States. So there was a reason to export this surplus to protect local markets. So this is kind of the, there's a col colonial kind of origin story um, of this, this surplus economy that is important to keep in mind. And then, of course, uh, ever since, I mean, we've, we've seen a kind of nonstop increase in volumes of clothing produced. So the surplus problem became ever bigger. So that's kind of the, the large backdrop. Um, and in terms of the kind of dynamics of this market, so there isn't a centralized system. Uh, these are so there's there's one level that is charitable. So that so involved are churches, uh, charitable organizations. Uh, some of these are really big, like famous players like Oxfam, uh, but others can be also local churches, for example, or church groups that then feed into larger collection systems. And um, what I also briefly mentioned, I think, is that during the 1980s, when this started to be a kind of charitable, a new kind of charity business, because it's very important, I guess, to, to just keep in mind that in terms of the in in in, in terms of the quantities of clothing donated. Um, it was a maximum of kind of 10% that was resold or reused locally. So the rest was always exported. So this is not a new phenomenon. And um, what is interesting to me is that from the 1980s onwards, uh, parts of the Tunisian diaspora, in mm -hmm. especially in Italy and France, recognized um, the kind of uh, business potential and mm -hmm. started to... Um, to um, started to work in or started to establish themselves um, collection and export companies. So these are private companies. So even if yes. let's say the collection at times can be done directly through charitable actors and then they hand over to private companies, at times it is also that on, on, the names are rented. So for example, Caritas uh, in Germany um, so, um, would, would rent their name to a private collection and export company. So they would do the collection in the name of Caritas. So sometimes it's completely kind of outsourced to private actors. And then, of course, here in Tunisia, as I said, it's a it's a private sector, but mm -hmm. a private sector that was very intimately connected to, let's say, the political economy of uh, the Ben Ali regime, and that that hasn't changed so very much since. I see. Yeah, that is very interesting, and. Um Maybe this is something I missed, but I was wondering, so of all these clothes that come into Tunisia, are these then being just reused locally or is Tunisia acting as a sort of redistribution center to other African countries? So maybe the southern of Africa, or I'm even thinking about some of the neighbors such as even Algeria and Libya. How does that work or whether they rely on different supply systems? Yes, so this is the, the kind of statistics that I, I showed very quickly that shows how Tunisia is uh, not just the, the kind of fourth largest importing country, which should already tell us something if we know mm. of the tiny market size of Tunisia that already tells us that this country is not just an importer for local consumption, right. but re-export. Right. And in terms of, so Tunisia is a, a major sorting location. So sorting happens in sorting factories and it then re-exports the packaged uh, bales of used clothing. 
and it re-exports to diverse places around the world from uh, Pakistan, India, right. to Sub-Saharan Africa. The largest quantities are sent to uh, West Africa. So this is the most important connection in terms of kind of re-export is to, to West Africa. Um, all of this on kind of shipping containers. But I think important to mention is also because we often don't think in that direction of the trade is also that they re-export to Europe. So mm -hmm. a lot of the kind of high-end vintage shops, et cetera, in Europe uh, will get their provisions from Tunisian sorting factories. So we have a kind of typical kind of cyclical idea where yeah. because, because free sorting is labor intensive and labor costs are high in Europe, uh, mm. This is why these processes are relocated to Tunisia, but then vintage shops in Paris will actually be ordering from Tunisian sorting factories clothes that might have been originally donated in Paris. So we mm. have a... Yeah, and that is fascinating. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's a full cycle. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you point out some of the issues, you know, the fact that this is not being regulated by the law or by a centralized system, um, but it's obviously a major contribution to the local economy. I was just wondering by, you know, since you've been engaging with many of these actors and people who run some of these businesses, shops, and they are engaged with the sorting of clothes, what is their view on this? Are they quite happy with things how they are being so sort of unregulated or do they think that actually a better organization would actually be preferable for their business? Yes, I mean, thank you. Thank you for this question. I guess it, it comes a bit back to this this first persona and, and C. Selim mm. and this idea of um, kind of the post-revolutionary state um, trying to reorganize the sector. Um, I think what, what is very interesting, and I want to kind of come back to this question of, I guess, I think what the Frip kind of in Tunisia is a good example for is that this, the kind of notion of regulated versus non-regulated or also formal versus informal doesn't often work. Because mm -hmm. so the, the, the Frip economy is generally described as a kind of realm of informality, of a parallel economy, this is and, and a kind of realm of state absence. This is how uh, it is described by both state and non-state actors. And of course, from the state actors, this is always described as a problem. So the Frip is a problem of governance, of economic governance and of... Um, if you look a bit closer, of course, you then see that actually the state is involved and it's even heavily involved and that to some extent it's an over-regulated sector, right? I said five different ministries are responsible mm. for the sector and they have vested interests in keeping this regulatory responsibility. So I would say this, the state is in diverse registers of action that are both formal and informal involved in constituting and making and remaking and renegotiating the market of the free. So to some extent, it's a very regulated economy. And I think the second maybe important question, um, of course, that the free poses, and that again is, I think, a question that matters to economies, or to thinking economies in Tunisia, but also other countries in North, um, North Africa, is the question of, well, what does it mean if the majority of uh, Tunisia's population work, for example, in what is called the informal economy, or if the informal economy is in fact the biggest part of the economy. And I think the FRIP is a very interesting example, because as you said, the FRIP is an extremely important employer in Tunisia. The FRIP is a crucial consumer good. Um, and as I said, the interior ministry stopped the reform because they were so scared of mass protests, knowing that if they actually kind of tax the free, there will be just a second revolution. That's a lot of what a lot of <laughs> traders said. And so I think the free is, in fact, if we think about the economy, should be central to how we think about the economy in Tunisia. And yet it is not considered part of the economy proper. So I think <laughs> this, this poses a very important kind of challenge and question also to say, well, what do we mean when we say economy? Yeah. What do we mean when we say the market? And, and I think that's a bit kind of part of what I hope to do with my book, to push this and to say, well, how, exactly, how do we think the economy? And, and even, I mean, in my case, 
to say, well, you know, how do we rethink um, what makes or constitutes the city or what should be what is preservable or not, or what is actually part of, of how we understand I the contemporary city? Yeah. Now, these are very important questions, and it's really fascinating how you are approaching them and tackling these issues. Um, so if there are any questions by some of the attendees and if they want to type the question in the Q&A box, I don't think there is any question at the moment. Well, that means your presentation was crystal clear and it was indeed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I particularly like the fact of, you know, how you see the economy, how can we define the economy given some of these internal contradictions? And I think there is this, this works quite well also on how we see ancient economies as well. And this is just myself being a classical archaeologist trying to make sense of some of these more recent issues. But it is very important that we keep these in mind. You know, if one looks at a pre-industrial society such as the Roman one, and yet it was such an advanced economy, if we think in terms of the amount of goods being produced, um, oil production, since we are talking about North African countries, well, definitely uh, Tunisia, Central Tunisia, Libya and parts of Algeria were part of this huge olive oil production uh, process that was key to the Roman economy. And I think this helps very much um, to look at how the ancient economy worked and what kind of eth ethnographic parallels we can find even in the contemporary world. And so I think this is providing a very interesting perspective. Okay, so, right, I don't think we have any questions, so you must be exhausted by now, and I don't want to monopolize <laughs> this conversation. So um, I would like to thank you again very much for this presentation. It's really, really important work, and we're really pleased to see how you're progressing on well on your book of course uh, which is also part of our build us fellowship but also the rest of your research um, in general so thank you very much for your presentation tonight katharina and again so this thank you so webinar... much for having me. oh pleasure pleasure so the webinar just to remind people that this was recorded and it will be uploaded on our youtube channel within the next few days so people will be more than welcome uh, to watch it online at that point. So thanks again and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so bye. much.